This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby, and I am Liv, your friendly neighborhood, Greek mythology-obsessed feminist. Well, here we are, back again with some classic stories of Greek mythology. We're so deep into all these stories and have gone down so many different rabbit holes and characters and stories and plays in this podcast over four years that I'm really enjoying heading back into some of the original roots characters like Hera from last week and some lesser known heroic exploits of next week. It's not something we're going to be doing every week and they are still going to be primarily new stories, but sometimes it's fun to dive back into those classic characters that I covered so briefly like four years ago. It's fun for me and I hope it's fun for you too. I will be covering brand new things, but I've I've mentioned this before. I've really run out of stories that are easier to cover. Not that anything is that easy. It still requires lots of research, but some are easier than others and some require like digging into the darkest, deepest depths of mythology where others don't. I am waiting on some new books though that I hope are going to be really helpful going forward. Still, until then, we're going back to some of the roots of this podcast while still exploring beyond them. Because, well, nerds, you've already read the title of this episode, so there's no hiding what a big day we've come to. We're diving back into the story of Heracles. Hercules, zero to hero, and all that. Because guess what? The labors aren't all of his madcap tales. No, ma'am. There are so many more to come. Today, we're diving back into the story of that famous hero in preparation for one of his lesser-known claims to fame next week. Because did you know that Heracles sacked the city of Troy before those famous Achaeans ever arrived on their thousand ships with that as-yet-unnamed horse of theirs? Because he did. We started laying the groundwork for this story last week with many stories of Hera. You might recall, I told you all that Poseidon and Apollo's punishment for the coup against Zeus was serving the king of Troy, Laomedon, and building walls around his newly founded city. And you may also remember that Apollo and Poseidon did this, and that they were some pretty incredible walls. And for that reason, Laomedon owed them something afterwards, even though it was their punishment. But when he didn't pay up whatever it was that he owed them, Poseidon was pretty angry, which is the part we care about. This is episode 125, Heracles' Origins, Abduction Apology Horses and Menacing Theban Vixen. It isn't only that bit of angry Poseidon backstory that we need in order to be able to fully be up to date on our next tale. I also need to remind you again about the young man named Ganymede. You see, Ganymede was the one boy who fell victim to Zeus's horrid ways. Zeus abducted poor Ganymede, and we can assume because Zeus assaulted him before installing him on Mount Olympus as the Olympian's cupbearer. I imagine that's a person who filled their cups with nectar, the drink of the gods. But here's the thing about the Ganymede situation. Zeus actually paid a kind of penance for that act. See, Zeus gave Laomedon, Ganymede's father, 12 immortal horses in return for, yeah, abducting his son. And I know it's fucked, but I do really want to break down this situation. Because it seems to me that 
this. The only case of Zeus abducting a young man rather than a woman is the reason why the boy's father actually gets something out of the situation. I don't say this to lessen the trauma of Ganymede or to suggest that men don't experience sexual assault or that it isn't as traumatic. All of that's true, but I do think it's important to point out that this occurred. And I would assume this is because the abduction of Ganymede is a technical loss to Laomedon, whereas if Zeus had abducted a daughter of the king, he wouldn't have lost anything and actually would have just been up money automatically as he wouldn't have to pay the dowry for a daughter. But when a son is abducted, Laomedon loses his heir, he loses a warrior, etc, etc, etc. So in that case, he actually received a form of payment. Of course, it doesn't make it any less revolting that he is paid for the loss of a child, but it is a dark thing to examine in comparison to the many, many women that Zeus abducted and did not provide any kind of compensation for. But today isn't about Ganymede. I've told his story in one of the Zodiac myths, Aquarius, along with in Zeus's original episode. No, today I just needed you to know about the horses. The horses are important. They are fancy horses. They are immortal and fast and, I don't know, whatever else makes horses impressive. More impressive than regular horses. They are all of those things. These immortal horses of Troy. Enter, finally, Heracles. Kind of, we're getting there. Heracles is, of course, the most famous hero of Greek mythology, even if he is more famously known by his Roman name, Hercules. Now, so far, I have really only told a fraction of Heracles' story on the podcast. We've covered the standard fare, those 12 labors, his claims to fame, if you will. But Heracles did so many other things in his life, for good or bad, that he will be sprinkled in through many stories to come. And he will have many more episodes devoted to his escapades. There's a whole mess with centaurs and murders I haven't even touched yet. In addition to that, the episodes where we were introduced to Heracles on this podcast were simply so long ago that I feel the need, nay, the desire, to remind you all of Heracles' origins as a hero, as a son of Zeus, as a messy human. Frankly, this is as much for me as it is for you, because I did this four years ago, so even if you listened fairly recently, like, it's been four years for me. We're doing a refresher. The origins of Heracles' Hercules begin in Mycenae with a son of Perseus, a man named Electrion. Electrion was ruling, and for reasons that are not entirely interesting, Electrion briefly left Mycenae in control of a man named Amphitryon, his nephew, to whom he also promised his daughter, Alcmene, in marriage. Things happened, bits of less than exciting drama ensued, and basically Electrion was killed when Amphitryon threw a club at a cow and it rebounded off the cow's horns and hit Electrion in the head, killing him. You've just got to appreciate the creative ways in which people died in Greek mythology. I mean, they did love a random near-accidental murder. Now, Electrion's brother, Sthenelus, was also involved in the whole kerfuffle, and he's the one who insisted that this bizarre accident was still technically a murder by ancient Greek mythological standards. And so Amphitryon was required to leave Mycenae and seek purification elsewhere. For that, he went to Thebes. All the good shit happens in Thebes. Meanwhile, according to Apollodorus, Sthenelus then entrusted the rule of Mycenae to the sons of Pelops, Atreus, and Thyestes. So clearly things were going to turn out just fine in Mycenae. But their story is not our concern here. Lord knows I've talked about it before. You can refer specifically to the episode on the curse of the house of Atreus for that incredibly entertaining mess. 
No, today we're talking about Heracles, which means we're talking about Amphitryon and Alcmene. Because when he left Mycenae, Amphitryon brought Electrion's daughter, Alcmene, with him to Thebes. She had promised to marry him if he avenged the death of her brothers, who had died in the war that had left Amphitryon briefly in charge of Mycenae. Frankly, as I've said, the details and time frame here are a little in the weeds, and it's all a bit much, and just not important enough for us to sort out right now. That, and it's really all in Apollodorus, and he was not one for the details. For our purposes, what we're concerned with is... Perseus was both Amphitryon and Alcmene's grandfather. The cousins were married, because of mythology, and they started in Mycenae and moved to Thebes due to hilariously accidental murder. That and Alcmene's brothers had been killed. In Thebes, it's where our story really starts to take off. Now, frankly, I've been quite torn about how to cover this bit of the story. I originally intended for this to be a basic, quick refresher on the birth of Heracles and his general origins, but turns out there's always so much more content that I wasn't aware of, and it's always super fucking fun. So now the reason we're caring about the war in Mycenae and the death of Alcmene's brothers is... When Amphitryon and Alcmene get to Thebes, they're welcomed and purified by its current leader, Creon. Now, of course, Amphitryon wants to actually marry Alcmene, make it official, you know, but she's said that she will only marry him if he avenges the death of her brothers. Bit of a good for her moment there, standing up for what she wants and also seeming to have some kind of say in the marriage in general. It's refreshing. So Amphitryon is looking to go to war again with the people who killed her brothers, the Telebians. Creon, though, will only help Amphitryon if he handles another little problem Thebes has been having. And yes, that little problem that Thebes has been having is 100% why I felt the need to talk about Alcmene's dead brothers and the war in Mycenae and avenging them all in the first place. Because, well, it seems that when they arrive in Thebes... It's currently being terrorized by a vixen. Yes, a lady fox. Thebes is being terrorized by a vixen. Or, as Jenny Williamson of Ancient History Fangirl noted when I texted these two about this hilarious anecdote, she was probably terrorizing them with cuteness. Get it? Because foxes are cute. So this vixen, we'll call her the Tumesian fox, has been absolutely terrorizing Thebes for some time. And why, you ask? Well, some say that Dionysus himself sent this fox to plague his homeland. You know how Dionysus feels about Thebes. Not a big fan, that guy. What with how things went down with his mother. <sighs> things were so bad there that the Thebans were exposing, i.e. sacrificing, basically, one baby per month in order to keep this vixen, this fox, fed. Otherwise, they said, she'd be carrying off many more citizens of Thebes. Which, I mean, doesn't really check out. One baby a month means she's fed well enough to not snatch away multiple Theban full-grown citizens? Like, grown-ass people? Seems mad to me. And probably just an excuse to expose some babies that they didn't want. But who am I to say? I'm just here to tell you that the Thebans were being terrorized to this degree by one single fox. It's fucking hilarious, but it gets better. Because all to say, Creon agreed to help Amphitryon avenge the death of Alcmene's brothers, so long as Amphitryon first handled the Tumasian fox that was terrorizing Thebes. How? How could Amphitryon handle this apparently bloodthirsty single lone fox? Well, obviously with a dog. But not just any dog. Amphitryon visited Cephalus of Athens and promised him a share in whatever they plundered from the Telebians once that war was fought in return for the use of his very special dog. <laughs> Cephalus, you might remember from an episode towards the end of last year, was mostly famous for causing the death of his own wife and for sexualizing a breeze. But he was also famous for a very fancy hunting dog. He was gifted the dog in Crete and brought the good boy back to Athens. The dog was famous for, quite notably, 
given today's needs, always catching its prey. Obviously, this was the perfect dog for Amphitryon to use to catch the vixen. Now, if you're expecting some epic showdown right now between dog who always catches its prey and bloodthirsty lady fox, you're about to be disappointed because this story comes from Apollodorus, which means the climax is, and I quote, So it came about that as the vixen was being pursued by the dog, Zeus turned both of them to stone. And that's it. And then Amphitryon and the others waged war against the Telebians to avenge the death of Alcmene's brothers. And they won, including an anecdote that perfectly mirrors the story of Minos and Scylla that I told last year, with a woman falling in love with a man who's warring with her father and thus plucks a magical hair from her father's head, causing his death, except the man that she fell in love with was Amphitryon here instead of Minos... Again, this whole story is quite muddled, and Apollodorus is not my favorite source because he's so brief and so late in the history of Greece. But my point is simply, Amphitryon and Alcmene can finally get married. But not before a certain god inserts himself into the story. Zeus. What a shit. According to the Shield of Heracles, which is a fragmentary work often attributed to Hesiod, though probably by someone else entirely, Zeus wasn't just feeling his usually horny self on the day he decided to become the father of Heracles by Alcmene. He had much more noble deeds, we're told. A likely story. The Shield of Heracles says that Zeus was planning for the future. He was intending to father a son who would serve as protector to all humans, punisher of evil, hero of heroes, etc., 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 blah, blah, blah. Whatever his reasons, just before Amphitryon arrived home to Alcmene in Thebes, once he defeated the Telebians, Zeus came to her first. He disguised himself as none other than Amphitryon himself, which, frankly, while not one of the most violent acts by Zeus, is definitely one of the grossest and most skeezy. In this case, she literally thought she was having sex with her husband, who'd just returned from war, victorious. She was excited and happy to see him, and in the end, it wasn't him at all. It was just Zeus in disguise. There are two versions of how the story diverges from here. Either Amphitryon, the real Amphitryon, arrived later that night after Zeus had had sex with Alcmene in his image, and so he slept with his wife then, or he arrived a day or so later to find her less excited to see him than he'd imagined, only to learn that as far as she knew, he'd already been home for at least a day and they'd already even had sex. Regardless, she also had sex with her human Amphitryon, and thus... In the logic and science of Greek mythology, and in the vein of poor Leda, Alcmene becomes pregnant with twins. One is the son of Zeus, the other the son of Amphitryon. But that isn't the end of the potential drama in the birth of this momentous hero. Because, you see, Zeus was getting very excited to have this epically heroic hero, the best of them, who is about to be born to this mortal woman down on Thebes, and so Zeus just starts telling all of the Olympians about it. He is bragging away, like, oh, just wait until you see the kid I fathered with this woman who didn't even know she was having sex with me. Ha ha ha, how crazy. He tells them that not only is he about to become the father of such an impressive hero who's going to do such incredible things for the Greek world, but also that this baby is going to be a descendant of Perseus, one of the OG heroes, and that this descendant of Perseus, who's about to be born, is going to also become this epic, 
king among men, a ruler of the Greek world. He's really amping up the king aspect of this future baby, this dream of dreams, this man to rival all other men, this descendant of Perseus. What he isn't being, though, is specific. And of course, Hera overhears. Hera overhears that not only has Zeus cheated on her with a mortal woman again, but he's also about to father a child who's going to be the strongest, best hero Greece has ever seen. And that kid, this next descendant of Perseus to be born, is going to be a major king in the region as well. Ugh. Hera is, unsurprisingly, annoyed. Who can fucking blame her? Now, do I love that she feels so good about fucking with the lives of mortals, particularly women who did nothing wrong? Of course not. But as I told you all last week, can I see how she feels like this is her only recourse to an absolute shit husband? Sure. Before Zeus has even finished talking about this new baby he's so excited about, Hera has rushed off with her daughter, Ilithia, because, well, there were two people pregnant with babies who would be descendants of Perseus, and they were both pretty far along in their pregnancy. Attempting to fuck with the future of Zeus's baby with Alcmene, Hera and Ilithia prevent her from going into labor with her twins, even though she is ready to pop. Whereas the other person pregnant with a baby who would be the descendant of Perseus, I can't find their name nor anything about them because what matters is this baby, Hera and Ilithia caused labor for them. And so the very premature baby, Eurystheus, is born first. Thus, Eurystheus, the descendant of Perseus, would be made king of Tyrans, this great, incredible, powerful king, instead of Zeus's forthcoming baby. Not a perfect solution, no, but it begins Hera's ongoing saga against this baby, her continued hatred and attempts to ruin everything about the man's life. This baby, whose name means the glory of Hera. Because eventually, obviously, Alcmene has to give birth. She can't keep the babies in forever. So she does, giving birth to Zeus's son, a baby they named Alcides, and Amphitryon's son, who they name Iphicles. Now, the couple know that one of these sons is not Amphitryon's. They suspected something, given the known issues around when Alcmene had sex versus when Amphitryon had sex, but it was the Theban prophet Tiresias who confirmed it for them. Now, if you ever hear me use this name, Tiresias, to describe a prophet of Thebes and think, man, that dude is in every story of Thebes. You're right, he doesn't seem to age, and yes, he's basically in every play revolving around Thebes and most of the mythology generally, he is a fixture of that city. But ultimately, our point, babies were born. From a very young age, Alcmene and Amphitryon could tell, as they suspected, one of their sons was not the biological child of Amphitryon. See, the heroic strength of young Alcides was clear from an early age. Whilst still a tiny baby, perhaps taking after his half-brother Hermes, Alcides did some pretty impressive things including saving his mortal brother Iphicles from two enormous snakes that had slithered their way into the baby's crib. Baby Alcides grabbed hold of the snakes, one in each hand, and squeezed and squeezed until the things suffocated. 
Now, were these snakes sent by Hera in the first of what will become many, many attempts to have her husband's child killed? Possibly. Others say that they were placed in the bed by Amphitryon himself as a test to determine which of the children was his and which was the child of Zeus. Regardless, Alcides proved himself he saved his brother and strangled the hell out of those snakes. This was just the beginning of Heracles' heroic exploits and just the beginning of Hera trying to fuck with his life. Because, well, at some point, he's given the name Heracles in place of Alcides. It means the glory of Hera. Was this because he or someone was trying to placate her? That's certainly my assumption. But the thing about Heracles, like so many other stories from Greek myth, but possibly one of the most epic examples of it, is that his stories are wide-ranging. They span the whole of the Greek world and beyond. They cross timelines and regions and whatever other barrier you can think of. There are variations and tiny details that change between all the varied stories that include the big and brawny and oh-so-famous hero. Why does he have to complete these 12 labors? A great question with many possible answers. To finish, though, the very initial story of his youth, Heracles was taught all that he possibly could need in order to become this best hero, Zeus's most prized mortal child, and probably only second to Athena out of all of Zeus's countless children anyway. Heracles was taught archery and wrestling and chariot driving and fencing. He was even taught how to play the lyre. He was to be a well-rounded hero, one who had many skills, and not only those that held up in battle or combat of any sort. Except, you know, he accidentally killed his liar teacher when he got a little angry and threw his liar at the guy's head with such force that the guy died. This might be a bit of an indicator as to what's to come in the young man's life. Zeus, too, we're sometimes told, was a changed man after the birth of Heracles. According to Robert Graves, Alcmene was the last mortal woman that Zeus ever slept with because he knew that he couldn't father a child that would be better than Heracles, so why bother trying? Now, this doesn't track with anything we know about Zeus's personality, so I call bullshit, but it's interesting all the same. It's also interesting because Graves also gives Alcmene the special treatment of, apparently, Zeus respecting her to such a degree that he didn't want to, quote-unquote, violate her by assaulting her, so he did the kind and noble thing and, you know, disguised himself as her husband and then had sex with her under wildly false and troubling pretenses. Thank the gods that's not considered assault. Oh, wait. As time went on, Heracles became more and more of the hero everyone knows him to be. He was huge, we're told, with physical measurements of his body that were well known. He never missed his mark with his arrows. His weapons never failed him. He was, in every sense of the word, a hero. He was a hero in the way that others weren't. He was Heracles, Hercules, zero to fucking hero, except he was never actually a zero. He was intimidating, though, and after he accidentally killed his liar teacher, Amphitryon wanted him away from Thebes, away from the family. Heracles didn't have to do time, i.e. be banished from Thebes and purified elsewhere, because he made the case that it was actually in self-defense It seems he says the liar teacher had hit him first. Still, Amphitryon was scared of him, and why wouldn't he be? So he sent Heracles off with the herds to be a herdsman away from most of the other humans. And there, at the age of 18, Heracles killed a lion of Mount Cithaeron, one of his first meaningful heroic acts, i.e. other than the snakes, the first time he helped out the people of the land. And, well, let's wrap up today's somewhat nonsensical primer on old Heracles with an anecdote from Apollodorus. Apollodorus says that when Heracles was planning to kill the lion, he spent time with the king of a neighboring region, Thespios. 
Thespios knew the importance and strength of this man who was staying with him, and he wanted those Heracles genes in his own family line. And, well, he had 50 daughters. 50. Heracles stayed with Thespios for 50 days, and every single night, one of the daughters visited Heracles to have sex with him. Heracles believed he was having sex with the same woman every night, which I mean, slightly less gross, maybe, except for the same very troubling issues of consent that his mother Alcmene faced with Zeus. Still, this is Greek mythology, and so every one of those 50 daughters conceived a child by Heracles. That godly sperm never misses. And so when those 50 nights were up, Heracles was a father 50 times over, and he killed the lion. This, according to Apollodorus, was the lion skin that he would wear from that day on. This lion skin that marked him as Heracles, that makes it super easy to spot the hero in iconography and art of any kind. Now, I subscribe to the idea that the lion skin that he wore was actually the Nemean lion, one of his labors. Regardless, it's an incredible example of how these stories are difficult to sort out, how they change depending on what your region is, what region the stories came from. Was it from Boeotia? Then it was probably the Catherian lion. Was it from the Peloponnese? Then it was probably the Nemean lion. As we slowly piece together more stories of Heracles, you'll get an even better sense of how little logic there is to it all, how little timeline there is, and how incredibly contradictory everything is. But that's for the future, because next week's story is nice and simple, and it takes place in Troy. Well, nerds, did I originally plan for this to be an entire episode on the origin of Laomedon's horses and Heracles in general? No, definitely not. But that's just how this podcast rolls, isn't it? Start doing something, meanwhile discover so many new bits and pieces and details and too messy and foxes that the episode devolves into something entirely different. I sure hope that's why you love me, because it's not changing anytime soon. <gasps> so with today's episode being devoted entirely to nonsensical origins of Heracles, next week's we'll dive into what today's episode was originally meant to be. That time he sacked Troy because of some fancy horses. Fortunately, there are a ton of other Heracles stories to tell, in addition to the fact that I didn't do the labors much justice in those first episodes of the podcast. So today's origins will serve well in future episodes. He is a famous one, that Heracles. The understatement of a lifetime. Ugh, nerds, thank you so much for listening. As usual, I, I couldn't be more appreciative of all of you hanging out with me for almost four years now. It's totally bananas. You are all the absolute best, and don't let anyone ever tell you differently. Back next week with some sea monster action on those old plains of Troy. I am Liv, and I absolutely love this shit as if I haven't made that perfectly clear by this point. My gods. My gods.